Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for accommodating our little bit of a later schedule this morning. We're very excited this week to be having HR 1 debated on the floor tomorrow. We'll pass. I will send it on to the Senate with all of the um, mobilization the outside can provide for cleaner government. This is HR 1, uh, and a priority for a freshman class. They'll be on the steps of the Capitol uh, tomorrow to proclaim their support for it. This is essential to our For the People agenda. <coughs> Lower health care costs by lowering the cost of prescription drugs and preserving the pre-existing condition benefit. Lower health care costs, bigger paychecks by building infrastructure of America in a green, modern way for the 21st century. But the public belief that we can do that depends on our passing legislation uh, to amplify the voices of the American people and reduce the voice of dark special interest money that has influenced decisions in Congress before. Uh, it is uh, also H.R. 1 about ending voter suppression. What are some people afraid of when people have a right to vote? It contains John Lewis's language, uh, fighting voter suppression. It also contains a path uh, to H.R. 4, which is to restore the Voting Rights Act to its fullest uh, efficacy as it was pushed back by the Supreme Court. Uh, and it, it, also, uh, it also is a, a way to uh, empower small donors and over uh, big donors so that the public again knows that everyone's voice is as important as anyone else's voice. Again, it was a confidence, it's about confidence, about ending skepticism. I've said in Texas a couple of days ago at a, such a, a, a town meeting on the subject of H.R. 1 and how it related to uh, voter suppression that uh, when we talk about voter suppression, we, we largely talk about reducing the hours that polling is available, the number of polling places, the number of days. Uh, it's about time and location, et cetera, in certain areas where polling places are closed. But one of the big suppressors of the vote is the suffocation of the airways by big, dark money misleading the public, uh, not telling the truth about what is at stake in the election. And public throws up their hands and then just decides not to vote. So this is, this is about honoring our democracy. Uh, we said we were going to do it as, as we have proceeded, building on what we talked about last week. The committees continue to have introduced bills, have hearings on bills to lower the cost of prescription drugs and protect the Affordable Care Act, uh, continue to have uh, legis uh, hearings on how we proceed on infrastructure, and HR won't be on the floor today. We also said we were going to pass legislation to advance common sense gun violence prevention, and we did uh, last week with H.R. 8. Next week, we'll be launching uh, our Equality Act to end the discrimination uh, and for the LGBTQ community, and we will also be launching our initiative to protect the Dreamers and the um, and temporary protective status persons in our country. One more bill before the end of the month will be well, two more. One will be equal pay for equal work, which comes back to our original lower increased paycheck, lower health care costs, increased paychecks, and we will be uh, on a path to pass once again the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. So we said these things during the campaign week, and we, we are getting it done, and we're telling the public about the paths uh, that we want to get them turned into law to make a difference in the lives of the American people. I was glad to send to the Senate and to, therefore, to the President uh, the Land and Water Conservation Bill, named for John Dingell, uh, the other day. So uh, while so much else is swirling around here in terms of investigations, uh, uh, the Mueller investigation, uh, the uh, fundamental responsibility of the Congress to have oversight over the executive branch and other items, uh, we are doing our housekeeping as we keep proceeding with legislation for the good of the American people. I was particularly happy this week that we were joined by four senators who had been former members of the House, Senator uh, uh, Leader Chuck Schumer, uh, Maria Cantwell, uh, Ron Wyden, and Ed Markey. They joined us to launch 
our net neutrality legislation led by Mike Doyle, uh, chair of the Technology Committee of the Energy and Commerce Committee, along with other members of the committee, including Chairman Plum. Uh, and as she was the godmother of that legislation, she too joined us. So uh, we're busy with our legislative work, despite what we might read in the press. <laughs> Madam Speaker, uh, do you think that Ilhan Omar understands why her comments were problematic, and what happens if this happens again? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for the question. Uh, I don't, I don't think that um, that the Congresswoman is uh, uh, perhaps appreciated the full weight of how it's heard by other people. Although I don't believe it was intended in any in anti-Semitic way. But the fact is, if that's how it was interpreted, we have to remove all doubt, as we have done over and over again. Uh, we're working now on a resolution to see uh, when we bring it to the floor uh, that will, again, speak out against anti-Semitism, uh, anti-Islamophobia, anti-white supremacy, and all the forms that it takes, uh, that our country has no place for this. But on anti-Semitism, we voted a resolution on that just recently. When I was uh, a couple weeks, a week and a half ago or so, in uh, at the Munich conference and then in Brussels for the NATO meetings, at every meeting, at every level, at the highest levels, our delegation impressed upon our European allies the importance of fighting anti-Semitism in our country. This is well before the you know, statement that, uh, that uh, emerged this weekend. But when it did, uh, it was important for me to speak to the member first before we would proceed. She was in Africa. Uh, after I spoke to her, members had different tacks they wanted to take, some their individual statements, some thinking we should have a resolution. I thought the resolution should be enlarge the issue to anti-Semitism, anti-Islamophobia, et cetera, anti-white supremacist. And that it should not mention her name, and that's what we're working on, something that is one resolution addressing these, these forms of hatred, not mentioning her name, because it's not about her, it's about uh, the, these forms of hatred. Does Madam she need to apologize? To that end. She hasn't apologized. Does she need to apologize? Well, she may need to explain that she did not, it's up to her to, to explain, uh, but I do not believe that she understood the full weight of the words to say, when you're, a when you're an advocate out there, as I was, so I appreciate all the enthusiasm that comes into our Congress. I told you that before. That, that was me pushing a stroller and carrying those signs. So I understand how advocates come in uh, with their enthusiasms. Um, but when you cross that threshold into Congress, the words weigh much more than when you're shouting at somebody <laughs> outside. And uh, I, I feel confident that her words were not based on any anti-Semitic attitude, but that she didn't have a full appreciation of how they landed on other people where this, these words have a history and a cultural impact that might have been unknown to her. Madam Speaker, sure, thank you. And to that end, I, I know... Did I call on him? Did you, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, sure, you sure looked at me. So. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Does that count? No, <laughs> not, not yet. I posed my, my question for you. Uh, but thank you. Uh, there was concern about motions to recommit yeah. that your side has had, and uh, I know you, how important HR 1 is to your side, and mm -hmm. that if you didn't address this right away, that that could be the motion to recommit and, and try to undercut what happened with the, with the firearms bill last week and so on and so forth. So was that part of the, the, the decision to go ahead at this point and get no, this okay. done? Out? Explain no. why. No, no. Uh, the Republicans will never fail to have their uh, xenophobic uh, motions to recommit as they did last week. It doesn't matter whether we have a resolution or not. So um, this has nothing to do with that. This has to do with, every, I see everything as an opportunity. This is an opportunity once again uh, to uh, declare strongest possible opposition to anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim statements, anti-white supremacist attitudes. <coughs> the president may think they're both good people on both sides. We don't share that view. So it has nothing to do with that. However, I, I do grant you that the Republicans will try to put these kinds of uh, statements in their motions to recommit. But that's housekeeping. That's Madam not Speaker, policy. Madam Speaker. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Obviously, Leader McConnell was very opposed to H.R. 1. Um, yesterday, he said, I believe we can actually win elections against people who vote for this. Do you think H.R. 1 puts any pressure or on um, some of your members in purple districts? Uh, no, no. In fact, many of the members in the purple districts are the ones who are the strongest proponents for H.R. 1, so I appreciate your question. Uh, H.R. Who is, uh, what the senator is saying, and, and with all the respect in the world for uh, his leadership role, he has also said the problem is not that there's too much money in politics, Mitch McConnell said, it's that there's not enough money in politics. Well, we vehemently, completely, thoroughly disagree. But it's about money in politics and what a, um, a, how that destroys the confidence people have in the political process, but also it's about voter suppression. And so whatever they say, what they are voting, when they say they're against H.R. 1, they are against removing obstacles of participation to voting in our country. How do you explain that to our founders? I did everything in my power, founders, to make sure that people did not have access to the polling place, those who were eligible to vote, and to be sure that they could vote and that their vote would be counted as cast. I don't know if you were here when I announced my Too Hot to Handle Club, I think it was last week. We just have to make some of these issues too hot to handle in the public. The shutdown of government was too hot to handle. When we, when we go past the Wet Violence Against Women Act, which is coming up again, we made it too hot to handle because the Republicans would not bring it up in the House. Uh, so along the way, um, the public weighing in on this, overwhelmingly the public supports removing voter suppression, lowering the role of big, dark, special interest money in politics, and uh, again, re re uh, respecting the rights of those who are eligible to vote, to vote and have it be counted as canceled. Madam, Madam, Madam Speaker, Madam Madam Speaker the, the, the House launched investigations on Trump. What kind of evidence does the uh, House right now have on Trump to launch all these investigations on, on him? And, couldn't this possibly be an overreach and no. essentially cause No, this is our uh, constitutional uh, responsibility to have oversight though? over the executive branch. And the evidence that they will have is what they will gather doing the oversight, bringing truth to the American people. So there's no evidence I salute yet? the committee for the action that they have taken. If we were not to exercise oversight over the executive branch, we would be delinquent in our duties. We're currently operating <laughs> no, currently operating under extraordinary measures because um, we've reached the deadline for the debt limit. What's the current plan to either raise or extend the debt limit? And are these conversations a few more days for that? Don't we? Isn't it? We're working under April. extraordinary measures right now. Well, the, the, according to the Secretary of the Treasury, those extraordinary measures will go until September or October. Uh, let us hope that long before that we will have lifted. Does that mean it's not an urgent problem? It doesn't mean it isn't urgent. It just means that we have to address it. Uh, everything is urgent here, right? Uh, no, this is urgent. Urgent. But everything is also an opportunity, an opportunity to have a giant civic lesson for America as to what the role is of government, of each of the branches of government, and the extraordinary nature of the president usurping uh, the constitutional powers of the legislative branch, Article One, immediately following the preamble. And that's why we were so pleased that we were able to succeed in passing that legislation. Oh, did I mention that? Under the leadership of Joaquin Castro. And now it's in the Senate where the Senate's senators are asking the president to withdraw. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, can you, can you address the of the Constitution of the United States? Madam Speaker, can Madam you Speaker. address the dangers of policing speech? You have spoken about this previously this year, when when one of your members used an expletive to describe the president. Earlier this year, when one of your members used an expletive to describe the president, you said you weren't going to be policing speech, and I wondered if you could talk about the wisdom of or the dangers of being of policing the speech of your members. Well, we are not policing the speech of our members. We are condemning anti-Semitism, anti-Islamophobia, and we are condemning white supremacy. So that is what we are doing. 
uh, and, and everybody who engages in that kind of speech is open in. He can use an expletive, collaborative and his expletive. You want to lose his language? I'm more concerned about what he does to hurt children at the border, uh, to degrade the air that our children breathe and rest. I'm more concerned about his policies uh, than his personality or his language. But nonetheless, if you're cleaning up everybody's language, we could start in the 